fellow grade 12 psychology class. Welcome back to another lecture. We have lesson seven today, social learning part one. Only three key points. One is Bobo doll, interesting. Two is the cognitive map. And three is helplessness, should be learned helplessness. It's just, you know, too chonky to fit on there. Let's get going with the Bobo doll. First thing I wanna do is I wanna to flip to the next slide and show you this picture actually. So. Uh, in this top row, I know it's hard to see, but it's old. It's from like the 60s, I believe. We have an adult throwing, punching, knocking over a doll. We call this the Bobo doll, and this is the Bobo doll experiment. In these pictures, we see a boy and a girl doing the same things, laying them down, picking them up and throwing them, punching them, kicking them, all of the same things. Um, that the adult is doing. And this is what we're talking about with social learning in general. We're gonna talk about this type more actually in the next lesson, uh, lesson eight, part two of social learning. But um, this is the whole idea that we just kind of learn from our environment and these kids are proving it. So would you treat Bobo this way? Children were told to play while in another part of a room, an adult model, quote unquote, aggressively played with a five foot inflated Bobo doll. The model laid the Bobo doll on its side, sat on it, punched it uh, repeatedly in the, in the nose, picked up a mallet and struck the doll in the head and then kicked the doll around the room. The youngsters were brought into a room that contained many attractive toys and also the Bobo doll. The children exhibited a good deal of aggressive behavior towards the Bobo doll. Uh, this behavior resembling that of the adult model. They essentially were doing what they saw the model uh, doing. And that's the basis um, for a lot of social learning um, and how we influence children. Uh, so it's a very famous experiment. Um, and if you have questions about it, I would love to talk about it. But the, the main moral of the story is that like, if you model aggressive behavior, if you show aggressive behavior to a child, they're pretty likely to imitate you and to do that as well. Okay. So Albert Bandura was the guy who performed this experiment in uh, 1961. I was right about the 60s. To demonstrate that children learned aggressive behavior simply by watching a model perform them. Uh, this study illustrated the third type of learning that we're going to talk about, which is social learning. Social learning theorists viewed learning as purposeful, going beyond mechanical responses to stimuli or to reinforcement. So sometimes uh, in the wild, um, like a mother lion would teach their children what to do by showing them. Uh, or maybe uh, I'm thinking uh, of a bird showing their children how to fly. Um, so there's a couple of types of social learning. Uh, one is cognitive learning, which we're going to focus on today, and modeling, which is the next one. So cognitive learning focuses on how we obtain information, we process that information, and we organize it. A lot of, a, a, kind of like perception. Such learning is concerned with your mental processes and not with behaviors. Uh, latent learning, which is learning something but not really realizing you're learning something. Cognitive mapping, which is creating a map of an area in your head, and learned helplessness are all examples. Um, not complete, uh, all of these, but these are all examples of cognitive learning. So let's talk about a cognitive map. A guy named Tolman would place a rat in a, a maze and allow it to explore the maze without giving the rat any reinforcement, such as food. Just let it go, just check it out. He would then place food at the end of the maze and record which path the rat took to reach the food. The rat was actually very quick to learn the shortest route. It was um, so like it kind of had learned a direction of which to go. The next part of the experiment, this guy Tolman blocked the shortest path to the food and then the rat followed the next uh, shortest path to the food. Essentially, the rat when exploring had kind of learned the layout of the maze, had made a cognitive map, if you will. Tolman believed that the rat had developed a cognitive map of the maze, kind of a general direction of turn here, dead end here, uh, middle here, side here, things like that. And a cognitive map is a mental picture of a place such as a maze. So you could draw that, your home, where the gym is, where work is, where your friend is, the park, the store, uh, you need to make a detour because the bridge is out, 
all those good things, you might have a general idea uh, of where all these things are. I have a pretty good idea of um, the layout of Morris, the layout of Winnipeg, um, and you know, kind of where things are general to in relation to each other in my head. You probably do as well to your hometown, which is part of your assignment actually coming up. Uh, so that's a cognitive map. Learned helplessness is key point three. So learned helplessness is when a person has numerous experiences in which his or her actions have no effect. So he or she may learn a general strategy of helplessness. If your actions aren't having any effect, um, you will learn that your actions have like that the, they don't mean anything. If you speak up at a party a few times and no one answers you, you'll learn that people don't want to listen to you and you might not speak up again. So in the first st stage of this one study that we're going to talk about, a group of college students were able to turn off an unpleasant noise. And there was another group that had no control over the noise. So this group could turn it off. This group had no control over it. Later, they were placed in a situation in which they merely had to move a lever to stop a similar noise. And only the ones that had control over the noise in the first place learned how to turn it off. The others did not even try. The people that had no control over the first noise had learned helplessness. They had learned that they had no control over it so that there was nothing they could do and essentially had taken no action. Uh, the people that were able to turn off the unpleasant noise took action to figure out how to stop it. Essentially, we get into this kind of uh, situation. Why bother trying? I can't do it anyway. What's the use in doing that? It will never work anyway. Um, that's learned helplessness when you don't want to try because you're convinced that it won't make a difference uh, and that's not really your fault you've learned that certain actions you've taken haven't mattered if you studied for a test and didn't do well maybe you've learned un unconsciously that studying doesn't really help you um, so these are all things that we need to take into account when dealing with people it's not hard to see how these results can apply to everyday situations in order to be able to try hard and to be able to be full of energy, people must learn that their actions do make a difference. Um, what's the point in recycling every day if you don't see the actual benefits of recycling? If rewards come without effort, a person never learns to work. And if pain comes no matter how hard one tries, a person learns to always give up. Uh, and it's these occurrences that are learned helplessness, that no matter what you do, you can't change the outcome kind of a sad thought. And we'll talk more about it in unit five, I think the very last lesson of unit five, uh, influential experiments. Um, we learn more about learned helplessness. It's an important element, uh, an important element of learned helplessness is stability. Um, and stability is essentially a belief in yourself. Do you believe that the um, thing that caused you to be unsuccessful is permanent? Or do you believe that it's temporary? Stability refers to a person's belief that the state of helplessness results from a permanent characteristic about that person. For example, a student who fails in math can decide that the problem is either temporarily, I did poorly on this math test because I didn't study very much, or I was sick, or I didn't work hard enough, or is it stable? Uh, is it a permanent characteristic? Like, I've never done well in math tests, I hate math, and I'm terrible at math. Uh, and I will never be good at math. Those are two different mindsets that you can bring um, to a failure. And if you are convinced that your failure is due to a permanent char characteristic about yourself, then what's the point in trying? If your failure is due to something that's temporary, temporary, something you can change, something that you can have an effect on, then it's more likely that you'll be able to work hard and change that um, result so you will not have learned helplessness some examples of how learned helplessness actually develops um, is you know when your parents or not your parents when parents punish children constantly for all offenses if you're overly critical for all your friends actions uh, if a student is placed in an advanced math course without first um, properly preparing um, these are all essentially situations where you're set up to fail and you will learn that no matter what you do, no matter what your friend does, you're gonna be critical of them. You're gonna not do well in math no matter what you do because you don't have the proper preparation. No matter what the child does, they're gonna be punished. So they're learning that their actions have don't matter at all. 
um, and some common factors of learned helplessness situations. Subjects believe that they have no control over their environment, that's permanent, uh, and that success is a matter of luck rather than of skill. So no matter how good you are at something, it doesn't matter for them. Their situation wouldn't change. They're just unlucky. We have some important terms as usual and then getting you to draw a cognitive map I thought was an interesting assignment. If you have questions about that, as always, please let me know. But thanks so much for watching everyone and I will see you soon.